Welcome back to another Top 5 video. Today we're doing the Top 5 Meme German Planes That Actually Flew. Every vehicle on this list completed at least one test flight, even if some of them may have been unpowered glider flights. Before we start, I should define what makes a plane a so-called meme. My definition is that it has to be unusual to what we consider conventional. It's a rather broad definition, but if someone tries to tell me they don't find the HE-111Z unusual, you know they're being a prick. I've also gone the extra mile by trying to find odd prototypes off the beaten track. So, you're sure to see planes on this list that you've never seen or heard about before. Number 5. The FGP-227 When a plane goes through the design phase, it is common to build a scale model for wind tunnel testing. Data is used from the model to help learn how the aircraft flies. When designing the BV-238, they took this concept to the next level by making a quarter-sized scale model. The BV-238 was Germany's largest flying boat during World War II, with only one fully completed before the war's end. The 238 was also the largest flying boat in the world for its time. It had six engines and a maximum takeoff weight of 100 tons. I know it's unfair to compare this plane to a conventional World War II transport plane, but I will. Just to put how big this plane is into perspective. The C-47 Skytrain had a maximum takeoff weight of 14 tons. Inside the FGP-227, there was room on board for two men, a pilot and a flight observer. It had six engines which produced a beastly horsepower of 21 horsepower each. The intent of the 227 was to test flight characteristics, but the project suffered some setbacks. The 227 was modified from being a seaplane to having landing gear. This was to make testing easier, as it could be done close to the factory where it was being made. This landing gear changed the design in the unforeseen way of not allowing the 227 to take off, either due to weight constraints or by making the plane less aerodynamic. Maybe both. The landing gear was removed and the plane was shipped to be tested on water. During unloading, the 227 was damaged. This took quite some time to repair. After repairs were done, the plane was tested for the first time. On takeoff, its engines died due to fuel starvation, causing the plane to have a rough but safe landing on water. When more repairs to the 227 were done, testing began again. This time, testing was successful. But no useful data was gathered from this project. A BV-238 had been completed and had already undergone its own testing. By the time any useful data was recorded by the 227, the only completed BV-238 had already been sunk by an enemy strafing run while it sat in dock. The damage was not repairable. Two additional 238 prototypes were not fully completed and they were not likely to be completed before the war's end. The 227 had been delayed so long that the 238 had already been built and tested multiple times before it had been sunk. Number 4 the Horton H7. The name Horton brings to mind the 229, the sci fi looking jet powered flying wing. Not a stealth fighter, you can fight me in the comment section about that. The Horton 229, or Ho 229 for short, is the ninth Horton design. The 229 that people are most familiar with is the V3 version. Version 1 was a glider, which had some teething issues, such as the nose wheel being rather weak. Version 2 was built to use BMW 03 engines, which were later switched to Yonkers 04 engines. Not on purpose, but by pure accident. The wrong engines have been ordered for reasons that I'll pass over for now. So, the 229 version 2 was to do its first test flight in 6 weeks with engines that were rather bigger than what it had been originally designed for. The 229 V3 was the last prototype made and was an improvement over the V2. And this is the version that is on display in the Air and Space Museum in Washington DC. Back to the H7. The Horton brothers idea of aviation mostly came down to knowledge of how gliders worked gained during the interwar years by Germany. The German military was not allowed to produce aircraft or airships as of accordance with the Treaty of Versailles. So German aviation enthusiasts took a liking to unpowered flight. Gliders, sailplanes, etc. The Horton Brothers' powered plane ideas mainly seemed to be strapping engines to gliders. This started with the H5. 
The H7 is mainly an improvement of the H5. While I was tempted to put the ME329 on this list, as it's also a flying wing, I felt that the H7 had more influence on history. But ME329 is a cool looking plane. It was designed to be a two crew, twin engine, heavy fighter. The 329 never flew under its own power and only flew in unpowered test glides. It was a dead end project that didn't go anywhere. The H7 first flew in mid-1943. It had a steel construction for the main body and wood for the wings. The biggest improvement overall is that unlike the H5, the H7 didn't crash on its first flight. The German Air Ministry was happy with the H7 prototype and placed an order for 20 of them. They were to be used as trainer planes. Performance was rather modest, with a cruise speed of 300 km per hour. The order of 20 H7s was not completed before the war's end. The H7 did help set the path towards the Horton 229, with flight data from the H7 being used in the 229's design. Number 3, the Backham 349, otherwise known as the Natter. For those of you that follow my channel, the BA 349 is no stranger to you. It's a German late war bomber interceptor. Its only armament is unguided rockets in the nose. The idea was that Natters would be located near industrial areas for intercepting enemy bombers. Using a rocket engine and disposable rocket boosters, the Natter would climb up to the height of a bomber formation and attempt one or two attack runs with its rockets. Just one of the multiple rockets in the nose would destroy a B-17. With its three and a half minutes of fuel almost exhausted, the pilot would bring the plane back down to a safe altitude and a slow speed to bail out with a parachute. The Natter had a mostly wooden construction and was semi-disposable in nature. The pilot would bail out by splitting the plane into two. The rear section containing the rocket engine would fall back to the ground on a parachute, while the front end would fall uncontrollably. Ideally, the rocket engine would be recovered and put back into a new Natter. The whole idea of vertically launched planes from stripped down pine trees using a highly unstable rocket fuel was a nutty idea. Cool on paper, but there were a lot of obstacles to overcome. I talk a lot more in depth about the Natter in this dedicated video I made, which you can find here. There will also be a link in the description below. The Natter did multiple unmanned test flights and several manned glider flights. Only one powered manned test flight was done, which ended with the death of the test pilot. Number 2, the ME-263. If that name sounds familiar to you, you might be thinking of the ME-163, also known as the Comet. The world's only mass-produced and operational rocket-powered fighter. Let me remind you, this isn't a jet-powered plane, this is a rocket-powered plane. If you thought aviation fuel was dangerous, then oh boy, the 163's fuel was deadly. It is two separate chemicals that were mixed in the rocket engine. Both of these fuels by themselves are very dangerous. Several 163s were destroyed in accidents related to unstable fuel. A 163 on landing still had fumes and vapours in the fuel tanks. This accidentally ignited and the pilot was killed in the resulting fire. 163s even caught fire during refuelling. The BA-349 used the same engine and fuel as the 163. All of these dangers discussed apply to the 349 as well. The pilots of the 163 had 120 litres of fuel right next to their legs, 60 on the left and 60 on the right. On takeoff, there were incidents where the takeoff dolly would bounce back up into the 163, causing a crash. Even with these dangers surrounding the 163, it continued operation. Its speed and climb rate were unmatched at the time by any other plane in the world. The 163 could climb from ground to bomber height in around 2 minutes which is extremely quickly for a World War II fighter. The ideal attack run would have the 163s speeding through the bomber formation in hit and run maneuvers. In reality, the 163 pilots struggled to hit bombers. Yes, they could go fast, but almost a little too fast to align their guns on the enemy planes. It also didn't help that the 3cm cannons had a low fire rate and a large drop off at range. The ME-263 was an upgrade to the 163. The mass-produced 263 would have a retractable undercarriage, which, not sounding that significant, is a humongous upgrade to what the 163 was using. The 163 had to land on a skid and take off from a dolly. The dolly and landing skid 
were high maintenance and very dangerous. The 263 also had additional fuel capacity of almost double the 163. The maximum fuel was brought up from 6 minutes to almost 15 minutes. This would have been extremely useful as flight range was a massive issue for the 163. As the 263 was being developed so late in the war, very little resources were used for its development. The 163 program had already been stopped due to fuel shortages, and the German Air Ministry were more interested in single engine fighters using jet power rather than rocket. The 263 only got tested in unpowered glider flight. Number 1. The Ju 88 P 1. The Ju 88 was a medium bomber that was quickly becoming obsolete as the Second World War went on. It was slow and couldn't carry much payload. In 1942, it was quite apparent that things were not going so well on the Eastern Front for the Germans. Soviet armor manufacturing was apparently producing endless tanks. The German Air Ministry started looking into ideas for ground attack planes that could use heavy auto loading cannons to solve this issue. This project resulted in planes such as the HS-129 and the Ju-87 refit with cannon pods. Experiments were done with the Ju-88 to see what kind of cannons could be used to turn this bomber into a heavy fighter. There were three prototypes of interest, the Ju-88 P1, P2 and P4. The P1 had a 75mm cannon with an auto loader. The P2 had twin 37mm cannons and the P4 had a single 50mm gun. Around 40 P1s were made. Well, that's kind of wrong. I mean, modified from Ju-88s. Oh, A4 variants. It was found that the performance of this variant took a severe hit with the 75mm cannon. The top speed was reduced and handling was worse. Even with additional armor plating around the pilot, it was very risky for this slow plane to attempt ground attack runs. Even so, it was pressed into serving in early 1942. The P1s weren't that useful as the slow speeds left them vulnerable to ground fire. On a side note, I see this image sometimes incorrectly titled on the internet as a 88mm gun Ju-88. Nope, it's a 75mm gun. And a little bit of extra information is that in the game Battlefield 5, I find it rather odd that they chose to use the Ju-88P with the prototype muzzle flute break rather than the mass-produced design. My guess is because, let's face it, the flute design does look a lot cooler than the standard muzzle break. Well, there you have it. Those are my top 5 meme German planes that actually flew. Tell me in the comment section below if you know any other meme planes that you know of. Doesn't have to only be German, could be anything. I hope you enjoyed this video and thank you for watching.